Guys, you know, it's, a, it's, it's no coincidence that as we sang that song, The Old Rugged Cross, we're at this place in the Gospel of Mark where we look at the cru crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we, le we left off a few uh, verses uh, after this, but I'd just like to read through you from Mark 15, starting in verse 24. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what uh, each one should take. And, you know, here down to the very nitty-gritty, the very clothing upon our Lord was, uh, was gambled for and was taken as a, as a booty, as a prize, as something that could be taken down and resold or reused by, by someone else. But the very clothing got stripped off of him. And it was about the third hour when they crucified him, uh, about 9 a.m., guys, and... Uh, uh, and the inscription on the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And, you know, there, there was no real uh, uh, charge against him that they could uh, verify, that they could justify uh, in what they did. But really, they hung that title upon him, the king of the Jews. And how true, how fitting that was that uh, uh, the Roman leader would uh, choose something like that rather than saying, hey, here, here's a murderer, here's a thief. Here's the insurrectionist, but uh, they, they called him just simply the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says that he was numbered with transgressors. And again, uh, back in uh, Isaiah 53, 12, we looked at that last week, where it says that exactly, that he was crucified with those uh, uh, that really de were deserved of being crucified. He himself of being on the cross to take the sins of the world, the sin of the world, guys. And uh, again, numbered along with the transgressors, and those who were passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. And here were all the near sayers, you know, they, they were probably cheering for him as he entered. Uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, you know, on that faithful day of his entry. But now, you know, they joined in, they were riled up, they were like with that mob-like mentality. And they just wanted to see uh, some blood. And, you know, uh, uh, it, it's funny that uh, at times we can be as those given over to the lust of the, the, the blood. And uh, they said that, hey, bullfighting is a brutal sport and cockfighting is a brutal sport. and. And now we, one of the biggest, bigger sports is, uh, you know, this mixed martial arts. And we see the guys getting hit and everything else. And it's such a brutal sport. And, you know, we've given into that. We cheer at the Rocky shows. And I, I remember watching Rocky with my dad early on. And uh, he said that's impossible because if a guy got hit like that, uh, they'd be dead. You know, uh, they couldn't stand all those blows. But uh, the people like to see all that blood and all the blows being taken place and all the brutality. And uh, I know one of the young uh, mixed martial artists, uh, fighters from Wainai, from Nanakuli actually, he was, uh, he was making a good name for himself, but his dad told me that, oh man, I'm afraid because you know it's all the hits to the head that he was uh, fearful that his son would uh, face this you know, long-term trauma. But here Jesus was uh, uh, brutalized uh, as such, and they were wagging their head, and it, it, it really becomes a symptom of our people, of the flesh, that hey, we love the blood sports, we like to see that things going on, and the brutality of it. And you know, we, we even uh, we kind of moan when we see some of these NFL players getting hit real hard and going down, and then you know, all of a sudden the guy's heart stops, and you know, it's too late after that, or they get a concussion that you know might be lasting for forever for a lifetime it's too late but he says uh, 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 the same way the chief priests also along with the scribes were mocking him themselves saying he saved others he cannot save himself and here again guys the, the amazing thing is the religious leaders of the nation of Israel were those mocking him and were those that were supposed to be anticipating the coming of the Messiah. And if they had looked at the Old Testament scriptures a little bit more carefully, they would recognize that, hey, he was truly the Messiah, come in the flesh, coming to be the Savior. Yet they discounted him and saying that, hey, nothing good comes out of this territory or nothing good can come 
out of this guy because look at his humble beginnings. He has no beginnings at all. As a matter of fact, he's, you know, um, he was born out of wedlock, you know, and all these things. And uh, uh, they, were, they were really mocking him. And then that's that same way saying that he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so we may see and believe. And I think that, you know, the world today, there are a lot of guys that say that, yeah, I want to believe, I want to receive the Lord, I've heard all about it. But they're at that place that unless they, uh, unless they see something so radical, something so dramatic, they're not going to uh, have any faith to say that, yeah, I want to just believe, I want to just trust in your word. I gotta, you got to do something for me before I believe, before I really receive you, before I engage my life in you. And you know, I don't know if, about you guys, but I've been talking to a guy, uh, just sharing with him, and you know, here's a guy, well-educated, has some money, you know, he was able to have a good career as a contractor. He went on to be a special inspector uh, at, uh, at one of the uh, colleges at, uh, in, in California for construction projects and you, you know yet he's undergoing a slow type of cancer that is slowly getting to him and he's slowly thinking and one of his friends said hey you mind calling my buddy and uh and sharing with him and you know it, it comes down to the fact that i did receive the lord i did uh uh, I did uh, ask him into my heart, but nothing came down. There was, there was no lightning bolts that came down and struck me or, or really said that, hey, uh, I'm born again or I'm saved from my sin. And he just went on his merry way many years earlier. And he still walks that way, still kind of wandering in the darkness, still kind of consumed with, oh, I'm busy. I'd like to love to talk to you a little bit more, but... I'm selling my truck and I, I need a ride and blah, blah, blah. And I'll call you, but you know, I'm still waiting for the call. But uh, 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 we may see and, and believe is the thing. And you know, many make that cry. We gotta see before we believe. And you know, sometimes it, it takes a, a step of faith, guys. We receive the Lord, we begin walking in faith. We begin just uh, hanging out with him. I, I know that that might have been the case with you or with me, just in the quietness, the stillness of the night, gazing up into the heavens and kind of just talking starry. I like to put it with the Lord and just kind of sharing, yeah, you really did, Lord. You know, all these guys are telling me about you and you know, you kind of dialoguing with the Lord and you, you thinking that, hey, am I going crazy? Am I flipping out? Or am I really having a conversation with the Lord? And is he really trying to speak back to me? as I gaze, gaze up into the creations. And you know, as, as we, we begin, as, as we begin to read the Bible and you say, how do I understand the Bible? And, and you can almost hear the Lord saying, hey, you gotta go to church, why don't you go to church? And they'll explain the word of God to you. And I say, what church? He said, well, what about that one they used to drag, the people used to drag you to? And, and uh, you know, you, you kind of give Jesus a chance. And rather than being led by feelings or emotions, you're led by faith. Rather than being led by the caboose, you're being led by the real in, uh, engine, which is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the completed work which he's done as he died on the cross for us. Let this king, uh, uh, let this, uh, this Christ, the king of Israel, now come down so that we may see and believe. And, and uh, those who are crucified were, were with him were casting the same insult at him. We recall in the gospel, one of the other gospels, where one of the, um, the uh, thieves relented and says, Hey, man, Lord, uh, can you remember me when... when uh, 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 when you come into your place, when you come into paradise, and the Lord says, hey, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was just that step of faith, acknowledging Him, acknowledging Him as Lord. And, you know, some, some is a, sometimes for people it might be a little bit more dramatic. For some other times, the Lord is gracious to allow you to go for a long period of time to, to where you finally relent. But sometimes, you know, it's almost, it could be instantaneous. And there's no, no chance because uh, you lost your chance maybe previously. You, you know, we could be taken out in a, in, a, in a moment, just snuffed out, you know, life taken. 
and uh, not have that opportunity to cry out to him. And when the sixth hour had come, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And the ninth hour, Jesus Christ cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which translated, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's like all the sin of the world fell upon Jesus at that time. All the sin of mankind fell upon Jesus. And, and, and God the Father just kind of stayed back and said that, hey, my son is going to take the entirety of all of the sins, past, present, and future, upon himself at this particular time. And all the darkness, all the darkness of the separation of mankind from God, man will see and uh, upon the light of the world who would come really to be the savior of the world. And some of the bystanders heard it and began saying, Behold, he is crying for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him, uh, uh, gave him a drink, saying, let, uh, let us see whether Elijah will come down and take, and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud crowd and breathed his left, last. And the veil of the temple was torn from, uh, uh, from two, from top to bottom. And you know, as we left off really here, the, the last time in this portion of scripture in Mark 15, really at the crucifixion of Jesus, guys, his last hours were not present to say the very least guys now stripped naked of of his clothing along with his dignity all the 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 things of the covering of mankind and we we kind of think that hey, we dress up nicely in the morning we come we we come into church we brush our teeth we wash our face we comb our hair we looking good and all the things that say that make us look uh, look decent and stuff like that. Now all stripped off of him. Now brutalized, uh, stripped naked of his clothing and dignity. He was brutally impaled on the cruel instrument of death, guys, on our behalf. Fastened by cords and then nailed through the palms of his hands. His feet were then impaled separately or possibly together with an iron spike. And if you kind of think of some of those old cowboy shows you used to watch, you had that blacksmith pounding, bang, bang, bang. And that was literally it. These iron spikes were forged by hand and, and, and pounded and shaped by hand. And they were gigantic spikes that through the palm of your hand and through the, uh, the bottoms of your foot, you were nailed to that cross. And of course, uh, they, they said fastened by cords on his wrists. But, you know, not much more held him to the cross besides those spikes. The cross was the most disgraceful and one of the cruelest in instruments uh, of death, guys. Whether of Phoenician or Carthaginian uh, origin, Rome would not allow one of its citizens to be crucified. In other words, if you're a Roman citizen, you're too good to be crucified because it's too cruel. Uh, 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 it was reserved exclusively for slaves and for foreigners. If you're a foreigner, if you're a slave, you, you're not a free man, and you do something bad, we'll crucify you, okay? But although the, uh, the crowd uh, cried out earlier, crucify him, crucify him, you know, these were the Jews crying out. They weren't the Roman soldiers, it was the Jews who were thirsty for blood. They wanted some blood. And, uh, you know, that just so shows the savagery of mankind. And you know, um, you you gotta draw the line. But you know, sometimes uh, uh, blood was just part of the sport. You think that hey, you get bust up, bust up in the boxing ring, you see the blood flying. When you look at that MMA uh, ring and you see on the canvas mat, it's it's full with blood stains. And uh, we were paying big bucks to go see that. And uh, uh, even early on, we used to go and cheer and watch, uh, you know, some of the guys, you know, from Waianae come and fight the, the big guys coming down from the mainland. And, you know, the, there's this guy, Monster Man Eddie, that got knocked out by one of the, uh, one of the boys from Waianae, you know, and uh, we were all cheering as he went down. And, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, uh, there was another young guy that they called him Benny the Jet, but he was such a really... Uh, uh, physical, physically, he was such a wonder that, you know, we were all amazed and we all go pay this money to go watch him, you know, kick some booty, you know, kick some butt, you know. <laughs> but, you know, the, the cruelness of mankind, we called, the, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. 
The mode of uh, punishment was un uncharacteristic for the Jews. The Jews never crucified anybody. They allowed the Romans to do this. But uh, their, uh, if their method of the death sentence, the, the Jews, was uh, pronounced upon a person, it was usually by stoning, by beheading, not too much better, yeah, by um, strangulation or burning. Wow, that's, that's kind of harsh itself. But I guess just the sheer brutality of the cross and the suffering that the people received on the cross was uh, almost un unbearable. Here the penalty of death would be carried out by the Romans with the religious leaders in a hearty agreement. As they discussed earlier and agreed upon, their answer being the death of Jesus Christ. We gotta, we gotta, uh, we gotta give the crowd a death of one person. We're gonna let this bad guy Barabbas go. We're gonna crucify Jesus because he's been rocking the boat as far as the religious system goes. Little did they know that it was the Lord's plan to give his son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Little did uh, they know that it was God's plan that his son, uh, that all the sins of the world would be uh, taken by his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this is where we are today, guys. And that he himself is the propitiation or satisfaction for our sins, as put, uh, uh, put by John in the, the book of First John. He's the propitiation for our sins, not only, not only for, uh, for ours only, but also for those of the whole world, guys. Christ uh, paid for the sins of the whole world. All we gotta do is receive that gift of forgiveness, the gift of life we had in him. Luke records uh, his final prayer, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. That's in Luke 23, 46. Jesus saying, eh, my hand, my life is in your hands, Father. And in John, his last words, it is finished. And you know, I think uh, it was shared, that was already shared from the pulpit in uh, John 19.30. Or simply put, the debt has been paid. We all had a heavy debt of sin, guys. We all couldn't bear that debt. The debt was so great, we could never pay it. It was only because of the grace, the unmerited favor of God that our favor has been forgiven. Just, just imagine, no more debt, you're set free. No bills, wow! <laughs> but you know, the bill of sin was that one that weighed heavy upon us. And you can see it. You can see many walking around on the streets, you can see the burden of sin just weighing them down so, so greatly. They might be the life of the party, they might, you know, they might use artificial stimulants to prop them up and you know, I'm always amazed. I always look at the, the sales on Sunday morning. I look early on and I, uh, I say, oh, if you buy 30 of this one beer, yeah, you can get it for less than a dollar a beer, you know, wow. But you know what, when I see the guys in the grocery store carrying that out, it's such a burden, man. If they don't have a wagon, wow. They're trying to carry it home, it's a burden. And I said, wow. You know, it, it's so attractive to make it. And the, the less you buy, the easier it is to carry, the more expensive it gets. But the burden of that is so great. The burden of that, um, uh, uh, that the, the spirits, the spirit of the world, guys. Christ did not die because of shock or the loss of blood or all the trauma he sustained. His life was not taken from him, guys but he died by an act of his will. He, he, he dismissed his soul from his body. He willingly surrendered uh, his soul from his body. And Christ was Lord over his death as he was Lord over his resurrection. In all things, Christ had uh, uh, control over this. He willingly laid his life down for us. And he willingly gave his life for us. He willingly says, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. You know, and, and he knew that it would be a painful death. He says, Father God, if there's any way, you know, uh, let this cup pass from me. But he knew that his cup was that, that he would die for our sins, guys. We pick up our study today in Mark 15, chapter 15, 
verse 38, and the veil of the temple was torn from, uh, from, to, from top to bottom. And the veil in the temple, guys, is said to have been 60 feet long by 30 feet wide. It was about a hand span thick. It was, it, it was a, some kind of felt material that was not only long, not only wide, but it was, it was very thick. It was, uh, it was so huge and so heavy that it was said probably as an exaggeration, guys that it took 300 priests to manipulate or to move the curtain to open it or to close it. You know, I don't know if it took exactly 300 uh, uh, um, uh, priests, but it took quite a number of priests to just move the veil aside. And to move it aside, it was only moved aside once, guys, because previous to this, it was only once a year that the high priest entered the holy place. It was just one. Otherwise, it was closed all that time. Only one man entered that holy place, and it was only once a year. But now the veil was torn from top to bottom. It was open for all mankind to come into that holy place of the Lord and have communion with the Lord. Those things separated us from God. Those things were separated and given the privilege only to the high priest. But now as we become the, high, the, the priests of the Lord, you're a chosen nation, you're a holy race, a royal priesthood, Peter writes, that we can come, we can enter into his presence. And we come, we often say, we come in with thanksgiving and with praise. Amen, guys? Because, you know, it's, it's the joy that God has given us access. We can come, we can commune. That's why I say that, you know, David's relationship as a young man was forged early on under the heavenly skies as he just hung out with the Lord. And I think he talked story with the Lord and he worshiped the Lord as a young man. And from these very humble beginnings, God took this man after God's own heart and, you know, the, would raise him up to be uh, the king over his, uh, his nation, to be a father within the community of believers, to be part of the, uh, 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 the progeny of Jesus Christ to, uh, as Jesus Christ would come. Uh, but in, in Matthew's gospel, we're told that the earth shook and the rocks were split and the tombs were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So at the death of Jesus Christ, hey, a lot of the graves were, were open. Remember, uh, Jesus used to call the Pharisees, hey, you whitewashed tombs. You, full of, you, you look so good on the outside, but the, on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Here, uh, the saints who had passed away before the, the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ, guys, their tombs were open and their, their, their bodies were raised, just like Lazarus were ra was raised, uh, as a witness for the world to see. Uh, those who have fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. So after that, that, that uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, these saints came into the city of Jerusalem themselves and they became living witnesses, living testimonies, known and read by all men that Jesus Christ had uh, raised them from the dead. And you know, when I call you guys a living testimonies, known and read by all men, guys that uh, knew you before maybe, they said that, oh, that guy, oh, that lady, she was a bad egg, man. She was a rotten egg. You better watch out, you know. But, you know, after uh, knowing that hey, their lives were changed because of the life, the life of Jesus Christ, and right now they see Christ uh, being written, not upon stone tablets, but on the hearts of men. And, you know, we become as the Word of God has become a, a, as a Bible to the world around us, guys. We become as those that appear to many, those living testimonies known and read by all men. In 39, when the centurion uh, uh, who was standing right uh, in front of him saw, he breathed his last. He said, truly, his, this, uh, this man was the Son of God. And this centurion must have seen and heard much of the goings on with Jesus, they heard that, he must have heard that hey, this guy claims to be God or people think that he's the, the Messiah who's come. And, you know, he's all these things going on, but he was just a, a centurion doing his job and following his orders. But with the witness of the Lord, the accompanying miracles, such as the darkness falling over the land, the earth shaking, and even as he, he took his last, last breath, 
all this affected this Roman soldier greatly, even to the point where he said, this man uh, was the son of God. This man was the son of God. Truly, this man was the son of God. And he, he instantly became a believer, probably, as he received the grace of God into his heart. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were was uh, were Mary Magdalene, mother, mother uh, Mary the mother of James the less, and Joses and Salome. And when uh, he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem. Uh, note that it was these uh, it was the faithful women who would not be ashamed or afraid of all that had gone on with Jesus' arrest, his sham court proceedings, his brutal beating and crucifixion. You might say they were all in and not concerned for themselves, but concerned for their Lord. You know, I, I kind of wonder about this statement because where are the, all the guys sometimes? You think it's, it's the faithfulness of the women, you know, much of the time praying. It's the faithfulness of the grandmas praying for the grandkids. It's the faithfulness of the ladies who come and see the ministry continuing on in service and so on. And uh, uh, not so much concerned for themselves, but they were concerned for their Lord. Here in 42, and when evening had already come because it was the preparation day, that is the day of Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. He gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, verse 43. Unlike the disciples who had run for fear from the Jews, we see now those coming forward, not only the women, but here in 43, Joseph is described as a prominent member of the council. In other words, he was up there in his rank. He was up there in his respect uh, uh, by the other Jewish leaders. And he was one who was looking uh, 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 he, he was one looking, uh, uh, waiting for the kingdom of God. Here in Matthew, uh, 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 in Matthew, he this, he's described as a rich man who had become a disciple of Jesus. That's in 2757. He was already there. He was rich. He was powerful within the, uh, the religious community. And he had already was, uh, was a follower of Jesus. In Luke, Joseph was called a good and righteous man, a member of the council. Finally, in John, Joseph is called a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one. Uh, this, sec this word secret could be translated as secreted, secreted or hidden away. He was kind of hidden away. He was uh, 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 not real outward with his, uh, uh, his belief of the Lord, but he was secreted away. Anyway, Joseph, we're told, along with Nicodemus, was there to provide spices necessary for a proper burial. I love Nicodemus, guys. You know, I often use uh, Nicodemus sometimes in um, celebration of life, memorial services, because many come under the cover of darkness like Nicodemus. And yet, you know, in their heart, they're kind of ashamed to say that, hey, I'm a Christian, but under the cover of darkness, they said, hey, Lord, we know that you got the words of life. You got the way, you know. I don't have that boldness yet to step up boldly. But here now we see these two men, one secreted and one who came under the cover of darkness, Joseph and Nicodemus. They came out boldly. The, I believe the New King James and the NIV uses that word boldly. They came out boldly. The, they had gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Yeah, the New King James and NIV says they came boldly. Remember, uh, again, these guys all of a sudden uh, from being uh, those secret believers, now they came over to Jesus uh, 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 to Pilate to get the body of Jesus. In 44, Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time and summoned the centurion. He questioned him as to whether he was, he was already dead. And this, uh, ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. It was a bold move on Joseph's, Joseph's part, casting away his own safety to the hand of God. In other words, sometimes you just say, hey, Lord, uh, 
I could be chastised for this. I could be ostracized from my brothers. It could be even a dangerous thing that they might attack me physically, whatever it might be. But he, he, uh, it was a bold, bold move on not only Joseph, but on Nicodemus. Uh, Pilate would release and allow Joseph to have the body of the Lord. In uh, 40, uh, 46, uh, Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him up in a linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in a rock, and rolled a stone against the entrance. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joses were looking on to see where he was laid. As the men uh, carefully wrapped Jesus' body, uh, uh, in uh, linen and anointing uh, him, he was laid in a new tomb belonging to Joseph, a large stone rolled against the entrance. Some uh, Bible scholars say that Joseph was one who was secreted away just with this particular mission uh, in, in, in specific to take care, custody, and control of the body of Jesus Christ. And he already had this, uh, this tomb prepared, a brand new tomb, which probably cost a large sum of money. But again, God, the Lord, had provided him with the wherewithal to have this tomb and to be the one to step forward and to say, hey, I want to take uh, care, custody, and control of uh, the body. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of an honor to do that. You know, um, sometimes you, you hear uh, that people are assigned, hey, can, can you stay with my brother? Can you stay with my loved one? Until they come to, uh, the coroners come to take him away. And uh, it, it's kind of like an honor it's kind of relaxing too at times. You, you kind of think that brother is a home with the Lord. You know, what, what remains is just as remains. His spirit has departed. He's, you know, in the arms of the Lord. And all the tension uh, of uh, seeing them go through the last moments of their life is all gone because you know that they're at home, they're at rest with the Lord. And there's no more pain, there's no more tear, there's no more suffering. All the things that held him back, the disease or the illness, uh, all of a sudden it's gone. And you kind of think that, hey, they're running, they're laughing, they're playing, they're rejoicing, running to the arms of the Lord, you know. No more, no, no more suffering. And again, uh, these, these guys were entrusted with the body. And again, notice that the, the women, those faithful women were there. In 16, and the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And amazing to see, the, it's the faith-filled women who come to minister before the Lord again. It was the faith-filled women who came to minister before the Lord. Where are the guys, you might ask? They were uh, nowhere to be seen. They were hanging out. I don't know what they were doing. They were discussing what we're gonna, what's going to happen now with the crucifixion of the Lord. Uh, uh, but these women, these servants of the Lord were there, uh, who were there. Uh, the, they were the last to leave after his crucifixion and death. And here they were the first on the scene to minister after the Sabbath. They came prepared. Uh, you know, isn't that amazing? They came prepared. They came knowing that we're here to minister. They came knowing, willing, uh, ready to uh, say that hey, we're here to, uh, uh, to bathe our love in the beautiful things of these fragrant spices. And it's, it's, it's kind of like that, hey, uh, uh, we, we come, we come to pray and bathe the Lord. Uh, the book of Revelation tells us that the incense is the, are the prayers of the saints. So as we come before the Lord, as we, uh, as we pray before, after, and during these, these periods of trial, they become as a sweet smelling aroma as unto the Lord. Uh, they were the last after, to leave after his crucifixion and death. And 
Here they're first on the scene to minister. They came prepared to anoint them the body. They were already thinking ahead and wondering, who's going to roll away the stone for us? You know, in the book of Joshua, um, uh, uh, there was a stone uh, that uh, as, as, uh, as, as the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River, as they were uh, prepared their hearts before the Lord, the Lord told Joshua that today a great stone has been rolled away from you. Uh, it's, it's, I believe it was called Gilgal, but the, the stone says a rolling of the stone. And it's just like the rolling of the stone away that opened up that way for us to see and to know hey, the resurrected Lord. Death could not hold him. And even as the children of Israel came out of Egypt, came out of that 400 years of, uh, of how many years of uh, incarceration and slavery, they would be, be, be saying that, hey, today the stone has been rolled away from you. Today, the women said, today the stone has been rolled away from you. Today the stone has been rolled away from us. And looking in, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. That's Joshua 5, 9, by the way, that scripture reference, guys. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting uh, at the right, wearing a white right robe, and they were amazed. Much to their surprise, I'm sure, they were, they were already, uh, the stone had been moved away, but we're told that it was extremely large. And get this, already inside was a young man dressed in white, in Luke's gospel, it tells us there were two men dressed in dazzling apparel. And I can only uh, imagine that there was an appearance of two of God's angels who were there and uh, just awaiting the, the, the first visitors and ready to give the good news. In verse 6, they said to him, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who had been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. And here was the good news. The woman must have been, uh, must have gazed in with wonder as they were told he is risen. And you know, we've often done this on uh, Easter sunrise morning and so on and so forth. But you know, all the more uh, dramatic is it for us as we, uh, uh, as we are reminded. And we, we can't take Jesus for granted. His death, his resurrection means so much for us. It means life for us. The body, his body broken for us as we come uh, before the communion table in two weeks. Uh, we are reminded, but daily we should be reminded, hey God, you paid the price for us. God, you gave your son for us. God, you gave your son that he would be the satisfaction of all of our sins, past, present, and future. And you know, as we, as we come before the Lord, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. And sometimes we're so careless. We sin without even thinking about it. We sin without even knowing. And we're sinning. And uh, we, we have that bad thought in our mind. We have that, that thing that says, Oh, Raka, why are you driving like that? And, well, you know, uh, something like that. But we're sinning. And uh, you, we're reminded of God, of what he, he has done for us. But they said, Go tell the disciples, Peter, he, uh, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went and they fled from the tomb, trembling and astonishment uh, had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I can imagine that. Because um, I don't know about you guys. Uh, you know, you might have had a close encounter on a spiritual basis. It might have been a dream. It might have been a vision where you, you're kind of shaken because it seems so real. And, you know, it, it, it was real because what God revealed to you was some kind of reality that he's going to, um, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to be tearing down those strongholds out there in the world, tearing down the strongholds that hold so many people. It might be very specific, tearing down the strongholds of the temples right up the road, the guys who chant, the guys who uh, 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 give the offerings on a daily basis. You know, and uh, it, it might be something so dramatic that hey, we tremble at the wonder of God. We tremble and are astonished because you know uh, that, that God is coming and he's coming uh, with a vengeance, you know, to take these bad guys out. You know? So, you know, uh, but, you know, before then, you know, it's, it's really 
God, is, God has come to save mankind from their sin. And as often as we, we detest the uh, religious worship of some people, some people are held by their little gods, some people are held by their money, some people are held by their power. And you can kind of think that, hey, how much money does this president need? How much power does he need? How much does he need to save his son from what he did, all the bad things he did for their family business, all the riches that came in? How much more does he need? And he says that he's a, he's a believer, yet he says, oh, uh, yeah, we can, uh, we can have same-sex marriage, we can have abortion on demand. And all the things that are contrary to the word of God. How, does, uh, how do you uh, draw the line with people who cross the line constantly, time in and time out? But yet God died for these as he died for you and I, guys. And we pray, we continue to pray, hey, Lord, be with our leaders, be with our family members who are led astray by the sins of the world, by the things that say, oh, I saw the guys kissing on TV, and I can take this pill and I'll be safe from the, the, the germs and all that. You know, and I'll be uh, free from the, the worry of HIV and this and that. But, but you know, and you, you see the guys walking down hand in hand, boy, boy, girl, girl, you know. And, 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 uh, and yet God, Christ died for them as he died for us. And sometimes the sin of others look be looks better on them. But our sins were pretty heinous too, guys. You, you gotta think about that. We gotta remember that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is so critical. We're gonna spend a little bit more time on it next week, guys. And you can read ahead and uh, a ponder on that. You can get a, 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 some reference books and, and look at the scriptures relating to that. But it's such a huge topic and it means so much for us that we'll spend a little bit of time next week in that. Otherwise, uh, have a great uh, time of fellowship today. We hope we see you folks on Wednesday night. Come on out for the Wednesday night midweek. Always a great time of worship, always a great time of fellowship, and a lot of room to fit, fit you guys in. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift we have uh, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your scripture that reminds us that uh, you gave your son, your only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have that everlasting life. And he, he came to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for, uh, for our sins, Lord, but not only for ours, but for those of the entire world, Lord. So we pray, Father God, that even as was prayed earlier from the pulpit, may you start, uh, uh, may you start revival here within our own hearts, within our own lives, within our own fellowship. But may you do an even greater work of revival on in the world before your soon and uh, certain return, Lord, because we, we look up and we, we, we see your coming is at hand, Lord God. And we wanna uh, be as those participating in taking as many with us as possible, Lord, before your return. We thank you, Father, we praise you again. Uh, Help us to pray and to love those uh, many sinners out there uh, uh, in the world and uh, that they would be saved by the love of Jesus Christ, Father. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.